Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We kickstart the show with a fantastic new approach to getting the most out of city breaks. But before we come to that, here's a look at what else is coming up. Grey to green, Patrick Blanc wows us with his inner city vertical gardens. Underestimated, a German wine is better than its reputation lets on. And sun, sea and sand, why the Spanish island of Ibiza is definitely worth a visit. In fact, there are so many places worth a visit, but to get a local insight on a city break, you might need to call upon Nectar and Pulse. This is an alternative travel guide which enables you to select a local in their directory who has similar interests to yours. That person will then share his or her favourite hotspots with you, making your trip more personalised. If we've only got a few days to see and experience a city like Munich, we'll probably want to consult a travel guide. In it, we'll probably find a standardised programme for the average tourist. Karina Schischel and Tanja Vos started their company Nectar and Pulse to offer an alternative to your regular travel guide. We offer very specialized travel guides that are carefully vetted. They contain exclusive tips from what we call local soulmates. Those are people who live in these cities and know their way around very well. They come from various subcultures and can give tips that are often off the beaten tourist paths. The two Austrians got the idea during their own travels. In 2011, when they were in their mid-twenties and fresh out of college, they started Nectar and Pulse with the first tour in Stockholm. Now they offer a range of travel guides packed with insider tips for 19 cities around the globe, available only on the internet. We send the customer a collector, which is a nicely designed binder and they can pick out the local person according to the interests they share. In Stockholm right now, for instance, we've got the It Girls and DJs. They go into the binder, and we can expand it as much as we want. The 30 tips from a local soulmate cost six euros plus printouts and cover restaurants, boutiques, clubs, and just generally interesting spots, more than enough to ensure an exciting weekend trip. The readers identify their soulmates on Nectar and Pulse's internet pages. Most of them are active in the arts. The customers get better acquainted with the guides and their interests from extensive printed interviews. People have less and less time and they just want custom-tailored tips. It's as if a friend took them by the hand and said, come on, I'll show you the town. The market is hungry for out-of-the-ordinary travel guides. Many internet pages offer tips from local people. They serve as a kind of online platform for their recommendations. Twelve Hours.net lists all the stops for a 12-hour whirlwind tour of a city. Nectar and Pulse has collected the knowledge of about 70 local soulmates, and the concept is taking off. Applications are even coming in from people who want to become soulmates. Nikki and Christoph Troje, for instance, list their favorite spots around Munich. Two years before, they themselves traveled to Stockholm with Nectar and Pulse's first guide. With this system, you can see the people and find someone who thinks more like you do. You get their individual tips, and you might easily end up in areas that a conventional travel guide would never send you to see. Tanja Roos and Karina Schichel took out loans and a considerable risk to found their company and make their idea a reality. The gamble paid off. Even the New York Times has run articles on Nectar and Pulse. And companies and hotels have hired the company to help on special travel guides. We'll definitely be expanding our product range. We've got plans for a mobile version and a pocket edition. 
Und ja, da viele spannende And lots of exciting products related to travel. Nectar Impulse's first travel guide in book form is due out at the end of the year. By then, the two young startup entrepreneurs will be old pros. The size of most buildings are unspectacular, but in some cities, this bare space is a great location for street artists or advertising billboards. In Paris, however, there is one man who's come up with a novel idea. Patrick Blanc is a botanist and the inventor of the vertical garden. Not only is his work eye-catching, it also brings a breath of fresh air to the city. Paris has a new and unusual garden. It can be found in the commercial Montorgueil district, and it's the work of Patrick Blanc, also known as the Green Man, with hair to match. There are hardly any green spaces in the second arrondissement, so that's why I thought this project was so interesting. I also like the fact that a private person wanted to commission a vertical garden not just for themselves, but for the general public. And the public loves this leafy oasis, so unexpected in this urban setting. It's lovely. I watched it grow. Everyone comes to take a look and photograph it. It makes me very happy. Every day I sit down here and admire it. It's a lovely sight. There should be more of them. This is what the facade used to look like. The structure of the garden was installed in February 2013 and the first greenery planted in April. Within months, the foliage began to flourish. And there were some unexpected developments. It looks like weeds are growing here. That was not supposed to happen, but it's a nice weed. Look at the blue flowers. That's part of a vertical garden, too. It's full of surprises. You never know what might happen. This is where Patrick Blanc gets most of his ideas. His own private jungle outside Paris, bursting with exotic birds, fish, and all sorts of plants. Blanc was only 12 when he had his first idea for a vertical garden. It's a pretty complex design. A fiber layer works like a kind of wet cliff. It's only three millimeters thick and it's kept damp through perforated pipes. The plant roots develop in this polymide layer and then a natural plant landscape emerges in the artificial substance. And because it's plastic, it doesn't degrade. Blanc's first major public project involved creating a vertical garden in 2006 for the Paris Museum Musée du Quai Branly, next to the Eiffel Tower. It was quite a challenge. This facade of the museum is exposed to the north and is opposite the Seine River. That means there's a lot of wind and it wasn't easy to find plants that suit those conditions. The Frenchman's green walls are now in demand all over the world. Blanc is currently working with renowned architects Herzog and Muron on an installation for a new art museum in Miami. I'm planting 70 columns there that surround the museum and are each 10 to 20 meters high. The museum is located right on the ocean, so I need to find plants that can survive hurricanes and salt water. He's also collaborating with architect Jean Nouvel to build a 200-meter-high vertical garden in Kuala Lumpur. These famous architects come to me with daring projects, and then we need to discuss things, because I know what the plants need. The architects, however, don't necessarily know that. 
But even Patrick Blanc can't say for sure how long his designs will last. His own, however, has been around for 32 years. Now, if I were to ask you to name some of the great winemaking regions of the world, chances are you'll come up with Bordeaux in France or maybe Marlborough in New Zealand. But did you know that Germany produces its fair share of fine wines as well? Although consumption is up, Germany is not getting the recognition it deserves. But like a good wine, a good reputation takes time. Germany has 13 wine growing regions. Alongside conventional large vineyards are many small growers whose individual approaches are producing top wines. The current trend toward light cuisine has made German wine very much in demand. A light fruity Riesling, for example. German wine has an excellent reputation with connoisseurs at home and abroad. But for the average consumer in Germany, its image is rather negative. Wine is far away for lots of people. They think it's something for snobs and know-it-alls. Its image abroad is not very good because other wine-drinking countries still consider German wines as no more than a low-quality sweet drink. That is still the prevailing opinion, but it's getting better from year to year. In France, they mainly drink wine with their meals, at midday and in the evening. In Germany, wine is more of a recreational drink. And then there's the state of Germany's red wine. French reds are still more popular. But experts say German red wines have a big future as global warming enables grapes to be grown in more northerly regions. In fact, in the past few years, some excellent German red wines have hit the market. Demand is growing steadily. We've got to the point where we can say we have world-class red wines. We're making them weep in Burgundy with our high-quality German Spätburgunder. And if you look at big red wine regions like Baden-Württemberg, we're growing Merlots, Cabernet Sauvignons, and they're almost better than in Bordeaux. But the sad thing is, is that we're still being compared. Young German wine growers are on the path to success. There's a new generation that has taken over their parents' vineyards and are putting a great deal of innovative energy into polishing up the poor image of German wines. Their motto is quality, not quantity. The self-styled young wild ones of the wine sector are not just devoted to quality in the vineyards. Well-educated and much-traveled, they're giving a new face to the business. As a vintner, you have to sell yourself personally, too. You have to show your face and create your own brand with your own smile and personality. After all, that's what we can embody by going to wine bars, bistros and spending a relaxed evening, throwing after-work parties. Not your classical grower with a wine fest on the estate. We really get active. Although Germany is among the world's 15 largest wine growing areas, the country's vintners are not confident enough. That's according to wine journalist Manfred Klimek. He knows that a small grower can't produce a clean, high quality wine for less than five euros a bottle. Top German Rieslings cost 30, 40 euros in wine stores or online. Some people say that's crazy, far too much. But look, in Austria, top wines cost 80 to 90 euros, if not more. French top wines from Alsace cost 80, 100 euros, not to mention the Pinot Blancs, which cost easily over 100 euros. And it's the same with top Italian wines. No one makes a fuss there when they cost twice as much. But here, even 20 euros is a sacrilege. Thirteen regional wine growing associations, dozens of local vintners groups and 179 wine growers cooperatives have joined forces to improve the image of German wine and broaden its consumer base. The regions are still, well, not enemies, but they don't get along. But they will have to pull together to make German wine more popular abroad and to publicize the high quality that it undoubtedly has. 
Today there are many German wines and many German wine growers who can hold their own with the world elite, maybe even with the very best. The key may be at home. If more Germans start to appreciate their own wine more, its image will improve, here and abroad. Now, as the summer winds down, we here at Euromax are happy to indulge in a little travel to prolong the holidays. So, we headed to the Spanish island of Ibiza. Of course, this island is normally associated with partying, but there is so much more to Ibiza than sun, sea and dancing until the wee hours. We went on a tour of some of the island's must-see sites. Sandy beaches with turquoise blue water offer the perfect retreat. The town of Ibiza's beautiful historical center is an official UNESCO World Heritage Site. The narrow streets seem simple and authentic, but in reality, property prices have skyrocketed. The mega yachts in the city's port reflect this development. Luxury tourism on Ibiza has taken off. Recently, Miami's famous Nikki Beach opened up a new club here. The visitors can catch a glimpse of the rich and famous while sipping champagne and listening to what the DJ plays. What makes Ibiza so special is that you can have someone who is uh, extremely uh, a, a high-class person from a high-class family or business and at the same time you can have people that are just here to enjoy the island and relax. I think it's that mix of people that makes Ibiza what it is. That becomes more apparent in the interior of the island. Hillside villages like Santa Gertrudis de Frutera have remained untouched by the jet-set lifestyle. For the past 50 years, the Bar Costa has been a meeting place for locals and tourists alike. It offers cold tapas and Spain's famous Iberico ham. Pepe Royish runs this third-generation family restaurant. The island's interior offers a more placid atmosphere. There are no clubs or noisy parties like in San Antonio, in Playa Don Bossa and Ibiza town. We have restaurants and bars. This is a quiet area. We don't have any problems here. People like the peaceful feeling. It's what draws them here. But not everyone is looking for peace and quiet. The Playa Don Bossa, Ibiza's longest beach, is full of event organizers promoting the club scene. Ibiza is famous for its party jet set, and it offers some of the biggest clubs in the world. The ads for them are everywhere. The Pacha can accommodate 4,000 people, which actually makes it one of the smaller discos. Nonetheless, it's known all over the world and runs clubs in 11 countries. Berlin-based DJ Fritz Kalkbener regularly plays gigs here. He enjoys the numerous parties the island offers. The island promises a never-ending party. There are no limits. There's no difference between weekdays and weekends. It just keeps going. And that goes for the social conventions, too. This idea of, I work here and I don't work there, doesn't exist. That's what makes it so strange. This place is outside the party scene. For the weekly hippie market Las Dallas, time seems to have stopped. For decades, thousands of tourists have flocked here every Saturday on the trail of the hippies who first discovered the island back in the 1960s. Up here in the north, we try to preserve the hippie heritage. I think it's the most valuable thing we have and people strongly identify with it. It's something we have to maintain. A few hundred families live on what they sell at the hippie market, which is mainly handmade art and handicrafts. Like 75-year-old Mora Schröder, who came to Ibiza from Germany 50 years ago. She sells crocheted dresses and is something of a celebrity at Las Dalias. It's the freedom we all have here, no matter whether you're young or old. Most of the young girls here say they want to be like me when they're old. That's nice to hear. It's uplifting for a 75-year-old. It makes me feel included and not like a granny who's been pushed aside. 
Stempel. <laughs> the hippie culture is still alive and well today. Every Sunday evening, old and young meet up at the Cala Beniras to play the drums while the sun sets. Then the quiet bay turns into an all-night dance venue. Street art has begun attracting quite a following as more and more artists are making a name for themselves in the genre. The German graffiti duo called Herakut are no exception. They specialise in painting murals with fictional characters and one of the most famous works is the Great Storybook Project which aims to promote interest in children's books. There's something better than perfection. According to this painting in the middle of Frankfurt, 15 metres high, the artist team Herakut are Falk Lehmann, also known as Akut, and Yasmin Zidiki, called Hera. Among the concrete skyscrapers, their image of a mother and a child stands out. Basically, our work is always a dialogue, simply because we work together. We tell each other stories, and the way we use these walls or canvases is like writing a diary. We create our own fantasy language to codify subjects that interest us. The work in Frankfurt took just five days. The image is from Herakut's current project, the giant storybook project about two teenagers living in a world of giants. Herakut were originally part of the graffiti scene, but now mostly spray walls only were permitted. This work was commissioned by the local authorities to prevent illegal graffiti. And it's worked. Hirakut are so well respected that other graffiti sprayers have refrained from altering the painting. The graffiti scene we come from is usually a closed system. It uses a certain language that only graffiti guys can understand. And you communicate with each other, which makes it a subculture. But we developed this design to communicate with a wide audience. That's when it turned into street art, art in public spaces. Within the graffiti scene, we're both kind of outsiders because of the figurative drawings and because Yasmin is a woman in a male domain. It's made us wary, but also given us more freedom to develop our ideas. Ideas created on the spot. She designs the figure's outlines. He fills in the details. Hira's creative illustrations and Akut's photorealistic spraying complement each other perfectly. Yasmin works with different mediums, the spray can being one of them. In our projects, I only use a spray. I apply a large color spectrum to give our characters a three-dimensional effect. When they're done, Hira adds a motto that's just come to mind. Great things have small beginnings. Sketches and texts make up the beginning of their new children's book. They've already published two books, presenting a chronology of their work together. Hirakut can actually make a living with their art. They also sell canvas paintings to galleries all over the world. But the street is their favorite canvas. This painting was created in Toronto last year. Like all their works, it incorporates mystical, even melancholic elements. Yeah, these are the things we it's usually the things we think are important and worth mentioning that end up with this serious undertone. But it doesn't mean they're negative. Melancholy is like a state in which you are completely open. We want to give the people something positive when we paint in public spaces, present them as something positive to think about. Hirakut have received invitations to paint on walls all over the world. Their clients range from urban art festivals to individuals and celebrities such as actor Jim Carrey. Their work can be seen from Tel Aviv to Montreal, from Shanghai to San Francisco, from Melbourne to Kathmandu. It's big in major cities. Street art is such a huge movement because it's the only art movement in history which is a global phenomenon. 
because of the internet. Young people everywhere know about it. And they're happy for us to visit where they live. The writings on the wall, as our Herakuts painted and sprayed messages. A welcome and colorful addition to daily urban life. And that's all the time we've got for now, so thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.